Okay, so this is chapter 21, Cardiovascular System Function Assessment and Therapeutic Measures for ATI. This is chapters 25 through 27 in your med surge book. This starts on page uh, 385. Uh, we'll discuss some normal anatomy of the cardiovascular system along with normal function assessment and then data collection, um, some common diagnostic tests done um, to diagnose cardiovascular disorders and then nursing care for patients undergoing these diagnostic tests as well as some of the common therapeutic interventions and then um, some pre-op and post-op uh, routines for uh, cardiac surgery. So the heart is located in the mediastinum between the lungs and the thoracic uh, cavity. Uh, the parasac is three layers, so the fibrous pericardium which um, forms the pericardial sac around the heart. Um, the parietal pericardium is the serous membrane that lines, that lines the fibrous layer and then the visceral pericardium or the epicardium um, is also a serous membrane um, on the surface of the heart muscle itself. And then there is uh, serous fluid between each one of the inner layers which uh, prevents friction um, as the heart beats. So this is just an anterior view of the heart and all of uh, the major blood vessels. So cardiac structure and vessels, there are um, four chambers. There are the right and left atrium, which um, are separated by the um, interatrial septum. Um, these have uh, actually thinner types of, of walls. And then the right and um, left ventricles, which are thicker walled and they're separated by um, the interventricular uh, septum. There are uh, different layers or different cardiac layers. So the um, epicardium is um, the outermost layer of the heart tissue. Um, or um, the innermost layer of the uh, pericardium, you can look at it that way, or the um, visceral pericardium. And then the myocardium, which is uh, cardiac muscle. And then the endocardium, which is smooth, um, epithelial tissue that, tissue that uh, lines uh, the uh, myocardium. So for um, the coronary arteries, these circulate blood uh, throughout the myocardium. Um, there are valves, the tricuspid, pulmonic, mitral, and aortic that are loca located between the atrium and the ventricles um, and in the pulmonary arteries and the aorta and these prevent um, backflow. Um, so blood flow, uh, the right atrium will receive uh, the deoxygenated blood uh, from the superior and inferior vena cava. Uh, the blood then flows from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Uh, the right ventricle then pumps the blood uh, into the lungs by way of the pulmonary artery. And then the left um, atrium receives the oxygenated blood from the lungs by way of the pulmonary veins. And then the blood flows through the mitral valves into the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle pumps the blood through the aortic valve um, into the aorta and uh, the, into the body. Um, conduction, uh, we have talked about this, so just a real quick review, remembering that the brain will send um, signals uh, to the heart and then uh, that will cause the SA node to fire sending the signal to the AV node and then the bundle of his and then the right and left bundle branches and then to the Purkinje fibers. Um, this action potential will cause a cardiac contraction um, and then closure of the valves creates that um, the heart sounds so that or the lub dub that you'll hear when you're listening. Again, this should be a review. Um, cardiac output, um, that's the amount of blood that's ejected from the left ventricle um, in one minute. The average resting cardiac output is between five to six liters per minute. Um, and then stroke volume is um, the amount of blood that's ejected from the ven uh, ventricle in one contraction or beat. So cardiac output um, is the stroke volume um, times the heart rate. Uh, and then ejection fraction measures uh, ventricular efficiency and is calculated by dividing the stroke volume uh, by the total blood volume that is in the uh, ventricle. 
Uh, normal ejection fraction is about 60%, um, and then lower numbers of ejection fraction would um, indicate dysfunction. So some of the hormones of the heart, um, epinephrine, which is secreted by the adrenal medulla in stress situations, is a uh, sympathomimetic. Uh, this will increase uh, heart rate and then the force of contraction, um, thereby increasing cardiac output and um, systolic blood pressure. Um, aldosterone, which is produced by the adrenal cortex, and this regulates uh, sodium, sodium and potassium. Um, and if you remember about talking about action potential, both of these are very important to cardiac uh, conduction. Um, atrial uh, neutric peptide um, is secreted by the atria of the heart. Um, and then, um, so increased uh, or in increased excretion of sodium by the kidneys. Um, Uh, inhibiting secretion of aldosterone by the adrenal cortex, and this hormone is um, secreted in response to the increased volume or pressure or stretching of the um, atrial walls, um, and this uh, causes loss of, the hormone causes uh, loss of sodium or water in the urine, which um, decreases volume, which will then um, decrease the blood pressure as well. Um, so blood vessels, arteries, um, these carry blood from the heart uh, to the capillaries. Um, they have thicker walls and they consist of three layers. The outer layer is uh, a layer of fibrous connective tissue which prevents rupture of, um, of the artery. Remember that arteries carry blood um, from the heart, so the, uh, these are really high pressure. Uh, the middle layer is a smooth muscle and is um, elastic con uh, connective tissue. Um, this layer contributes to uh, blood pressure by uh, changing in diameter um, of the artery or changing the diameter of the artery. And finally, the inner layer is um, simple squamous epithelium, which is uh, smooth to prevent any types of uh, blood clotting from happening. Um, veins, these carry blood from the capillaries to the heart. Um, they're relatively thin-walled because there is much less pressure in the system. Uh, the lining of the veins is like the arteries, um, smooth to prevent clots. Um, there are also valves in the veins which will uh, prevent backflow from happening. And then capillaries are one cell thick to allow exchange of gases and nutrients and waste products between um, the blood and the tissues. So blood pressure. Um, this is blood forced against uh, blood vessel walls. Um, as a review, blood pressure is affected by many different forces, so um, heart beating fast or slow, strength uh, of cardiac contractions, fluid volume, elasticity of large vessels, etc. Um, normal blood pressure would be 120 over um, 80. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism or system, um, remembering that the kidneys play a key role in the regulation of blood pressure through the use of this system. So decreased blood pressure stimulates the kidneys to, to secrete renin, um, which initiates um, this mechanism to happen. So renin changes the angiotensin to angiotensin 1, which is then converted to angiotensin 2, and this causes um, the atrials to vasoconstrict, um, stimulating the secretion of aldosterone. And then the vasoconstriction causes increased blood pressure, and then the aldosterone um, increases the reabsorption of sodium water back into the um, system or back into the blood, which also will um, increase uh, blood pressure through that um, increased volume. So pathways of circulation, um, there's pulmonary and systemic. So uh, pulmonary deals with the pathway of um, deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle through the lungs and into the left ventricle. Um, and is uh, systemic is the flow, um, and then systemic is the flow of oxygenated blood from the left ventricle out to the body, um, and the path of the deoxygenated blood returning to the right uh, atria from the superior inferior vena cava. Um, portal circulation is a part of the blood of this uh, blood flow through the portal vein and into the liver before returning uh, to the heart, and is um, again part of the systemic circulation. Um, this pathway, as a review, allows the liver to regulate blood um, levels of nutrients and then remove any uh, potential toxins before it, uh, the blood is returned back uh, 
to the heart and into circulation. So aging and um, the cardiovascular system, so conduction is less effective, which can cause dysrhythmias. Um, atherosclerosis um, leads to narrowed vessels um, with rough surfaces, so you can get clot formation and decreased blood flow to the heart and other organs. Um, resting blood pressures increase, um, which can lead to left ventricular workload increase um, and then to left-sided heart failure and stroke. Um, we have de decreased heart rate, which can um, lead to fatigue. And then the veins and valves um, become more incompetent, leading to venous stasis, um, which then can lead to ulcers. So cardiovascular disease um, is the number one killer of people in the United States. Um, healthy lifestyle plays a major role um, in this. So um, things that you want to consider are smoking cessation, certainly dietary fat reductions, um, checking your cholesterol, those kind of things. Uh, two servings of uh, oily fish uh, weekly, so tuna or salmon can help as well, and then exercise also. Um, so there is a campaign for women out there. It's called Go Red for Women, and it's the American Heart Association's national or nationwide movement um, to celebrate the power of women. Um, have to band together to wipe out heart disease. And what happens is the color red and then the red dress is linked um, to this ability. So you'll see pins or posters or things like that with this little red dress on it. If you want more information about the Go Red for Women campaign, you can go to um, www.goredforwomen.org. So for cardiovascular assessments, we want to get a really good health history, uh, physical assessment, and then we'll do some diagnostic studies um, as well. So for, for health history, you can gather symptoms by using that what's up mnemonic. Um, childhood illnesses um, such as rheumatic or scarlet fever can lead to heart disease, so you want to elicit if they've had any of those types of childhood um, diseases. Um, do they have any allergies? What is their past medical history? So do they have high blood pressure, lung disease? Um, have they had a stroke? Do they have kidney disease? Uh, what medications are they taking? What is their family history? So does there have any family history of those things? So remember during the lectures, we talk a lot about a lot of these things are hereditary. So we want to know if they have a tendency towards having these problems. What are they doing for health promo promotion? Do they exercise? Um, do they eat well? What are their cholesterol levels? Um, do they have any risk factors? So are they smokers? Are they overweight? Um, those kind of things. Have they had any previous hospitalizations or surgeries? Um, baseline diagnostics are also helpful to have for comparison. Uh, do they have any functional limitations related to any cardiovascular problems? Uh, we'll get a full set of vital signs, so looking at their blood pressure, what is their pulse rate and rhythm? Um, this should be listened, um, listened to apically for at least one full minute. We also want to listen to their rest, uh, their lungs and get their respiratory status and then check their temperature as well. So on inspection, we want to look for um, how they're oxygenating. So again, how is their skin color? Um, how are their extremities? What's their hair like? Um, what's the distribution of the hair that they have? Um, skin color, temperature, moisture, those kind of things. What do their nails look like? Are they clubbed? Um, are they normal? How are they? What do they look like? Do they have any cyanosis? Do they have any jugular vein distension? How is their capillary refill? Um, just want to look at all of those different things um, that might be clues to us that they're having some type of cardiac issue. Um, so palpation, um, there's um, something called point of maximum impulse or PMI, which is um, the apex of the heart. Uh, the PMI is located in the fifth intercostal space at the point of the intersection with the left mid, mid line. Um, so sometimes you may be able to palpate this, and um, if it is palpable, you'll feel this thrust um, felt when the um, ventricle contracts. So you can't feel it on all people, but you may be able to feel it on some. And we certainly want to check extremity temperature. So are they uh, poikilothermic or room temperature? Um, do they have any edema or they have a positive home and sign? And this is um, if the calf or knee, when they have calf or knee pain, um, when the foot is dorsiflexed. We want to listen T4. So S1 is uh, the beginning of systole when the tricuspid and mitral valves close. That's where you hear that lub sound. 
um, S2 is the uh, start of diastole when the aortic and uh, pulmonic valves close, and that's where you hear the dub sound. That's normal, so remember you should hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Um, and then S3 is a sound uh, like a gallop. Um, it's a lower pitched sound, it's heard. Um, more early in uh, diastole. This is normal in children or younger adults, but um, it might be caused by left heart failure or fluid overload or problems with mitral valve um, regurgitation in adults. So and that's more of a galloping type of sound. And then S4 is similar to the gallop, but it's heard late in diastole, and it usually will occur um, with hypertension, um, CAD, or pulmonary stenosis as well. So murmurs, um, these are caused by valves that don't close tightly enough, so this is more of a swishing type of sound. And then pericardial friction rub, um, this is usually caused by inflammation of the pericardium, and it sounds kind of like um, sandpaper being rubbed together um, would be a good type of description. Um, there are certainly many different types of, when we talk about diagno diagnostic studies, there's lots of um, Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals around this, um, and we're going to talk about a few of them during um, this lecture specifically. Um, one of them is to improve ac accuracy of patient identification, so here's where we're using at least two patient identifiers um, whenever collecting laboratory samples or administering medications or blood products. So these two identifiers are usually name and date of birth, but I would say that in some facilities they do, um, they do use something different. So just be sure that wherever you work that you check for your um, facility's policy um, about two identifiers and that you use the two that they have identified um, as ones that they would like to use. We also want to use two identifiers to sample, uh, to label sample, um, to label samples of collection containers, and you want to do this in the presence of the patient. So you identify the patient using those two identifiers, you have the labels for the specimen with you, um, and then you label the um, specimens before you leave the patient's presence. So right at the bedside. Um, there's also um, a patient safety goal about um, immediately prior to any invasive procedure um, to conduct a final verification process to confirm that it's the correct patient procedure site um, and availability of appropriate um, documents. Um, this is usually called a timeout, and you want to make sure that the timeout is done, even if it seems redundant or silly. It's really about making sure that we do the right things. I mean, I'm sure that all of you have heard in the news about people that um, go into surgery and they have a leg amputated or something else crazy that happens to them and it's the wrong patient or the wrong um, appendage or something like that. So um, certainly want to make sure that this timeout happens prior to, um, the, and the patient should be involved in it, so prior to um, any type of invasive uh, procedure happening. So non-invasive diagnostic studies that can happen are chest x-ray. This can show the size, position, and contour, and the structures of the heart. Um, certainly CT scans can be done, and then MRI imaging as well, which are um, much, much more in-depth uh, evaluations of structures of uh, blood flow. Um, electrocardiograms. Um, again, this records the um, cardiac electrical activity and can identify abnormalities in conduction, rate, rhythm. can also see if a um, heart attack has happened, if there's electrolyte imbalances, if there's any type of ischemia or um, heart chamber enlargement as well. Um, so this can um, look for uh, risks for ventricular dysrhythmias, the signal averaged EKGs. Um, these, um, these record lower lo or low level signals that are not really detected by um, normal EKGs. They can also do ambulatory um, electrocardiograms or monitoring with halter monitors, and this is a small a recording device that is sent home with the patient for up to 42 hours, and then the patient will keep this diary um, so when they feel something odd or um, something's going on, they'll kind of push a button to mark the recording, and then they'll write in this book what was happening or what they were feeling during that time so that the person who is evaluating the recordings have 
an indication of what was going on when the person pushed the button and marked it or what was going on in that particular part of um, the electrocardiogram at that time. They can also do echocardiograms and this is uh, ultrasound and this can record motions of uh, motions. It can look at heart structures and valves, the heart shape, size, and position. Um, a lot of times the EKG is recorded at the same time just for comparison um, purposes. Um, here's where they would look at um, ejection fractions so they can look at how much blood is moved through versus how much blood is still in that ventricle. So they'll look at ejection fractions with um, echocardiograms as well. And then we've talked about the transesophageal echocardiograms as well and here the probe is um, uh, put down through the esophagus to look at the heart. Um, there's usually a clearer picture here because uh, the lung and rib tissue uh, does not have to buy the sound waves in order to see it. Want to make sure that the person is um, MPO uh, about six hours before the test and then they also remain MPO until their gag reflex returns. So exercise stress tests, uh, these are cardiac stress tests and they look at um, cardiac response to exercise and increased oxygen needs. Um, they can do um, peripheral vascular stress tests as well, um, looking at the vascular response to walking. So if, um, again, looking at problems with circulation to the lower extremities or to the extremities. Um, if intermittent, intermittent claudication occurs, um, they would stop the test. So other types of non-invasive diagnostic studies, um, uh, plethysmus myography, um, and this measures blood volume and changes in blood flow um, to diagnose deep uh, DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. Um, and here uh, what will happen is the patient will lay supine and then the leg uh, being tested is raised 30 degrees and then a pressure cuff is inflated on um, the leg to distend uh, the veins and then blood flow is measured with electrodes and then the cuff is rapidly deflated and then venous volume um, changes are recorded and then um, thrombi would be um, detected by uh, reduction in venous uh, volumes. So uh, arterial stiffness index uh, measures the stiffness of the um, brachial artery to determine um, atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease risk. Um, they can also do tilt table testing um, where they do um, lying to sitting to standing blood pressures and heart rates and this is used to diagnose or uh, the cause of syncope. They can also use Doppler ultrasounds to look for impaired um, blood flow um, which would you would see um, reducing uh, sound waves if there was a reduction in uh, blood flow. Radioisotope imaging, um, so here radioisotopes are given um, IV and then uh, a gamma camera scan is done to detect any type of cardiac ischemia or damage or um, problems with perfusion. Um, thallium, um, uh, technetium and then technetium 99 and then MUGA scans and then PET scans or um, uh, positron emission tomography are all examples of the different types of uh, radioisotope imaging that can be done. So different types of blood studies and I think we've talked about many of these but um, certainly they can talk for uh, or check for blood lipids. So um, looking at things like uh, cholesterol levels, so triglycerides, uh, phospholipids, etc. Um, can also look for um, and literary response. Uh, it's uh, very sensitive and can actually predict uh, risk for MI. And then going back to cholesterol, real quick, that increased levels are associated with um, cardiovascular diseases. So making sure that those um, levels are lowered is going to be important. Um, Homocysteines, this is amino acid that can damage the lining of the arteries and promote blood clots. Um, so increased levels again are associated with cardiovascular disease. Uh, cardiac biomarkers like uh, creatinine kinase, troponin, or myoglobin um, can also be um, 
used to help identify current or, rec or, or recent MIs. Um, and then magnesium, which is important to normal cardiac function because um, low levels can um, actually cause arrhythmias. So more of Joint Commission National Patient Safety go Goals. Uh, we want to improve uh, effectiveness of communication among caregivers. So um, it's uh, really important um, to, again, record um, if you're taking orders by telephone or any type of critical values. We want to verify those, read them back, and have the provider read them back to us to make sure that they are um, they are uh, the correct orders that we're getting or the correct values that we're giving, okay? Sorry that the slide is a little messed up. I didn't notice that until we got here, but I will uh, go in and edit that later. Invasive type of studies that can happen, angio um, angiography, which dye is injected into the system and look at the, to look at the vasculature. You can certainly do cardiac catheterization, which allows um, the um, heart anatomy and physiology to be studied. It can also measure pressures in the heart and the chambers, great vessels, um, and coronary arteries. Um, they can also do interventions like do stent placement or other things to open up blocked vessels. Um, certainly they can do some hemodynamic monitoring um, or cath is inserted or attached to a transducer. Um, this can be an arterial line or a CVP monitor. They can also do um, electro uh, physiology types of studies as well. CVP can be measured indirectly through a pulmonary artery cath and this reflects uh, the pressure in uh, the vena cava. For therapeutic interventions, um, we can use um, exercise or walking programs to promote the blood flow. They can go to cardiac rehabilitation. Certainly we want to do smoking cessation uh, to decrease uh, vasoconstriction, which again decreases blood flow. Uh, balanced diet and weight loss. Um, oxygen to ensure that the heart receives sufficient um, oxygen to function. Other therapeutic um, interventions can be anti-embolism types of devices, so um, elastic stockings, which apply pressure over the leg to promote uh, movement of the fluid and prevent uh, stasis, and then those intermatic, uh, intermittent pneumatic compression stockings, or the SCDs, um, which are inflatable, and they apply pressure intermittent, intermittently, um, which stimulates contractions of the leg muscles, um, also, again, promoting uh, fluid movement, which, again, will help prevent um, thrombus uh, development. Um, so some of the medications that you might encounter for patients uh, with cardiac problems, so you might see uh, cardiac glycosides, vasodilators, antihypertensives, antidysrhythmics, antianginals, anticoagulants, and then thrombolytics as well. So lifestyle and cardiac um, care, we want to work on decreasing risk factors. Certainly support groups, uh, groups can offer encouragement. Um, one of the bigger topics that we need to think about is sexual activity. Um, patients are often pretty anxious about resuming sexual activity. Um, so counseling should be offered to the patient um, and to their partner to give them um, information regarding about when they can return um, to normal sexual activity, et cetera. So lastly, we'll talk a little bit about um, cardiac surgery. So um, if cardiac surgery is necessary, uh, pre-op, we want to gather really good baseline assessment data and prepare the patient for surgery. Um, anticoagulants will be stopped uh, four to five days preoperatively, and then diuretics usually two days preoperatively. Um, for cardiopulmonary bypass, um, they may use a bypass pump that delivers blood into a machine um, that does the work of the heart so that the heart can temporarily be um, bloodless and motionless during the surgery. Um, for general procedure for um, cardiac surgery, we want to be sure to prepare um, the patient and their family for um, post-op things, so explaining tubes, equipment, etc. Um, anything that can help really decrease the stress um, when they come out. We also want to discuss uh, pain management as well. There are minimally invasive cardiac um, surgeries that can be done um, without a bypass machine, um, and this has um, minimal invasive heart access with a peripheral um, cardiopulmonary um, uh, bypass. So. 
that is cardiac surgery. So again, if you have any questions, you can post these on the discussion forum. You can also call me or text me or 